on. Hello, everyone. This is Eric Glazer, and I am super excited to uh, introduce you all to our guest today, Dr. Talia Schwartz. She is the president and chief executive officer of Metro Plus Health Plan. Dr. Schwartz was appointed the president and CEO back in 2019 during her tenure. Uh, Metro Plus Health has achieved 20% growth in membership, a five-star rating from New York State Consumer Guide, and an increase in overall net worth as well. Prior to her appointment as CEO, she served as the organization's chief medical officer. She was a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Pennsylvania and served as a fellow at the National Institute of Health. She received her medical degree at Sackler School of Medicine and completed her residency in pediatrics at Maimonides Medical Center in Brooklyn, New York. Also practiced at Children's Medical Center down in Washington, D.C. So a really great background in history. If you haven't heard of Metro Plus Health, they're the plan of choice for over 600,000 New Yorkers, recently ranked the number one health plan among all 15 New York State Medicaid plans in overall quality. And what makes them unique and why I have Dr. Schwartz on the show today, in my opinion, is what makes them unique is they have a really robust network of employees and primary care doctors and specialists for, that are uh, incredibly diverse in language, race, uh, and just cultural background and culturally competent. So that is going to be the theme a little bit of, of, today's, of today's conversation. And so welcome to the show, Talia. And I'd love you to start off by telling us a little bit about what you think makes Metro Plus Health unique. Thank you, Eric. I am uh, thrilled to be speaking to you today. Um, so Metro Plus Health Plan is New York City's health plan. This is our service area in New York City. And if you think, well, you're small, it's just New York City. Just know that New York City itself has more population than 40 other states in the US. Uh, and based on their recent census, we have uh, about 8.8 .8 million people live in New York City. Um, so we are the city's plan. Uh, we are a wholly owned subsidiary. We're owned by New York City Health and Hospitals, which is the largest safety net system in the US. Uh, we are a public benefit corporation uh, and we provide mostly um, benefit spon um, government sponsored coverage, but we also have uh, coverage for individuals and for employers. Um, as you mentioned, uh, we have over 600,000 uh, covered life at this point, over 620,000 covered lives. Um, and really our passion uh, and our mission is to focus on the underserved population. And I agree with you, what makes us unique is that we serve a very, very diverse population here in New York City. Uh, and we serve them successfully because we are a very diverse type of uh, a plan. We intimately understand our members and their needs. Uh, we live where they live. Uh, we speak the languages they speak. Uh, and we truly understand the needs that they, that they have. And so a derivative of this uniqueness is that we significantly uh, invest uh, time and resources and, and, uh, and thinking and executing on all of the needs that our members have, not just access to excellent medical care, but really to other services uh, that they are accessing or need to access to support their health. It's a perfect segue to my, my, my next question. And I, I don't want everyone to know who's listening. My underlying goals of the conversation today is to bring out unique perspectives and programs that Metro Plus has put into place in their market. Uh, but I, I want you to know that we're trying to stay away from necessarily anything that's specifically unique 
to New York City. I, I think there's going to be a lot of things you're going to hear today that are going to be applicable to your urban centers, your rural areas that uh, for the populations that you serve, whether you represent a health plan or, or a provider or some other ancillary service that plays into the system. So I want to start because you, you, you noted it a couple of times in, in your intro statement about localism. And I want to talk about why localism is so important in a healthcare strategy. And how do you see local as being a lever to being a financially healthy and clinically effective organization? Yeah, uh, and, and you're right. We absolutely see uh, us being local as a tremendous advantage to how we operate and how we can support our membership. Um, so not only that we are focused on New York City, we uh, address each borough separately. And even within the five boroughs, each area separately, uh, because the um, populations that live in the different boroughs and within the boroughs vary significantly in terms of their needs, the, their cultural background, their expectations, how they prefer to receive care, how they prefer to communicate with the plan. Um, so while we are headquartered in Manhattan, we have community offices in the various boroughs. So we are uh, geographically embedded within, within the communities. And what uh, a local office uh, in a neighborhood allows us to do is really uh, to build very, very deep roots uh, into, into the community. Uh, what this means is that once we establish uh, a local community office, uh, we really, really deeply know what happens around us. So we uh, become in a way a hub uh, for that community, not only just for people to come uh, and get covered uh, or renew their coverage or resolve any kind of issues that they may have, we also host events for the community there um, in, in those offices, educational events, engagement events, uh, health screening events. So we become a known entity uh, in the community. We tend to staff uh, those local offices with people who live in the community come from the same cultural background, frequently speak a second or a third language that is prevalent uh, in, in that area uh, and already somewhat well known to, to the community. Um, and usually the leadership for uh, those uh, offices then is tasked not just to provide kind of top-notch service for our members and obviously uh, bring new members, but also uh, create lasting relationships with the community. So we partner with local libraries, uh, with houses of uh, worship uh, in those communities. Uh, we uh, work very closely with local uh, elected officials. Um, and so really build kind of longitudinal relationship uh, with people who influence the, the community uh, and then, of course, we also work very, very closely with the provider network. So um, the relationship is so close that providers come to our uh, community offices for, for various reasons. And obviously, um, there is a flow of uh, members to the providers and, uh, and, and vice versa. Providers recommend us because they know uh, the services that we are uh, offering. To, to our members. So, so you have uh, five offices in five boroughs or in each borough you have multiple offices to match the communities within the boroughs? Uh, so it varies. Uh, in some of the boroughs we have one. In Queens we have three uh, because it's such a large borough and so diverse. In fact, we just opened our third uh, community office in Flushing uh, to support the, the Asian population uh, more closely. So uh, just thinking about scale and just operating uh, an organization, understanding that now, because you have such unique neighborhoods in the five boroughs, how do you scale your efforts to partner with community-based organizations 
the government, the local government officials, the libraries, everything that you just cited, but to be able to do that multiple times over, you know, I, I don't know what the number is, but it sounds like dozens of different little markets that you have to almost run sort of pseudo satellite companies in each one of those markets. How do how are you able to effectively do that? So for folks listening, they could figure out, is this even applicable and scalable at my organization? Yeah, so we actually are pretty lean uh, in how we're structured. Uh, it doesn't take a huge workforce um, to deploy into the community offices. Uh, we have kind of a, a core team in the community offices, and then they are backed up by our headquarters and our, and, and our central office. So it literally takes about half a dozen people uh, who are physically placed in the community offices who do the groundwork and then all of the support is coming from, uh, from the headquarters. Um, so it is absolutely feasible financially, it doesn't take an army, but that local presence, ongoing local presence um, with a physical space, even though everybody is transitioning to online and remote and Zoom and Teams and social media, um, especially for uh, the underserved populations, especially for the immigrant population, uh, the physical location uh, is still meaningful. Uh, we had a lot of deliberation be before we just opened our third office in Queens. Um, and there were good questions that were asked whether this is the right thing to do in, the, in this area, especially right uh, in the middle of the pandemic or somewhat, somewhat phasing out, hopefully out of the pandemic when so much uh, transitioned even more into remote kind of operation. And our belief is at least for the foreseeable future for those populations, that physical presence is still, is still meaningful and is still important and has benefit. But as I said, it, you don't need an army um, to, to staff those, uh, those physical locations. You have a core of people. Uh, it is very, very important that those people are very familiar uh, with the community uh, that they serve. It's also extremely important that your network is such that it supports the community, right? So if you are a mostly Chinese neighborhood, it is very, very important, obviously, that you will have enough providers who speak the, the, the different dialects. Um, so we make sure that the core people on the ground are the right background, the right language. Um, the network um, is structured in a way that uh, it's compatible uh, with our efforts. And then we scale it with kind of more streamlined operations in the back office. Do you have, does, is each one of your local offices, do they have access to social determinants data and, and how much is sort of social determinants and underlying cultural theme of the organization? Yeah, so social determinants is something that we take very seriously, we invest in very seriously, we actually have a task force dedicated to social determinants, specifically where we made the most inroads is around housing, which is a completely non-trivial uh, undertaking. So all of the, all of the um, associates uh, are aware of what we are offering in terms of social determinants. What's local in, uh, in terms of, uh, of uh, social determinants is we, partner with different community-based organizations, different CBOs. So the CBO that we partner with varies from location to location because the CBOs are hyper-local. So it helps us to form a pretty, pretty tight relationship where there is bi-directional uh, referral flow. And frequently we actually uh, co-locate with the CBOs. So if the CBO is providing significant uh, social services support to the community, our, some of our people will be in the same physical space. So while referrals into CBOs can happen virtually and happens virtually, and we, we have that centralized uh, on kind of a larger scale, 
we also do this on a local scale with services that are available locally for, for the community. So we are, we're using a CBO uh, that identifies um, all kinds of needs that our members have across the entire city, whether it's housing or food and security or legal or uh, house modification, really whatever, whatever the members need. So we have kind of one centralized CBO that we work with. And then we also have local CBOs uh, who help us with more local needs. And we refer to those CBOs for whatever needs our members may have. Those CBOs in return, again, know us and know how we operate. They refer um, members, members to us. So it's a, it's a pretty fruitful collaboration for us. Do you have any way, and I don't, do you have any way of measuring the effectiveness of any one of those individual partnerships, or do you just include the overall costs, meaning the resources required to maintain multiple CBO relationships across a huge city as just the cost of doing business? Yeah. So I'm sure uh, that you and the listeners know that it's very hard to uh, measure the financial impact. Having said that, um, I do want to go a little more in detail about our collaboration around housing. So the housing initiative um, is kind of a three-legged initiative where we're leading the chart. We collaborated with a CBO that focuses on uh, supportive housing, and we collaborated uh, with uh, the Human Resources um, Association here, the HRA, and specifically uh, uh, with uh, their social services and housing department. And so uh, having created this collaboration between the housing CBO, us and, and the local agency, we were able to secure housing for our most vulnerable uh, members. And we're talking about people who are chronically homeless, um, who have frequently um, mental uh, issues and substance, substance abuse issues on top of chronic medical is issues that they are dealing with. And so we were able to place approximately 200 individuals in supportive housing. Um, took a long time to create agreements, to create workflows, to really make this go, but once uh, kind of the pre-work was done, uh, we were off to the races and uh, we made a pretty significant dent. We started tracking what happens to those members that we house in terms of outcomes. And just a quick note, once we place them in supportive housing, we're not done. Uh, we provide ongoing support. So we make sure that when they are housed, they know their new environment, they know how to operate there, they have their doctor is there, they, have, they keep their appointments, they take their medication. So we are very, very hands-on. This is not just place them and, and wish them luck. This is really place them and support them uh, because fre frequently those members have ongoing issues. And so we do not want them to bounce back into the shelters or back into the streets. So um, through this collaboration, we're able to find the housing, place them there and, and manage them there uh, throughout their tenure. And so we've been um, tracking the outcomes. It takes a long time to see, uh, to see an, an impact. It takes between two and three years until you actually have uh, sufficient data to show that there is, there is impact. So here's what we know as of today. We, looking at those members, we know that we're seeing decrease in acute utilization. We saw a decrease in their hospitalizations, both medical and behavioral. Um, we saw uh, that there was a decrease in, uh, uh, in their um, emergency room uh, utilization. Um, they are reporting a significant increase in quality of life. When we ultimately ran this against statistical models to say, well, is it statistically significant or, or not? We can say now with certainty that the emergency room utilization has decreased in a significantly statistical way. So this is the first indicator that we are confident saying was impacted. Uh, and we stand behind it. All the other ones, the decrease in hospitalization, medical and, and behavioral, 
are all trending favorably. Um, we're still not at a statistically significant point. We think it's just a matter of time. The, the trending is very, very, very significant. You just need enough time and, and enough people uh, to get to a significant. So I think that all indicators are showing that by next year, we will show decrease on all of those measures. And, and this is based upon an N of, did I hear that right, 200 people right. that you showed? Right. Wow, so it makes that big of an impact, 200, bam. And now you've got, you've got some ROI tied to it. You do, you do. So, right. so again, not, none of this is as trivial. And as I said, it took a few years to show it. Uh, we did this initially because it was, as you said, it was cost of business. It's part of who we are. We focus yeah. on the vulnerable population. It was very clear that only securing access to care and doing kind of the more traditional care coordination is not sufficient for our populations. At any given time, um, Metro Plus has approximately 10,000 homeless members. Um, so wow. they come in and out of uh, homelessness, so it's not a stable population, uh, but it's a significant number. So as we were looking at this population, we're looking at their utilization, it was very, very clear that this is something we wanted to invest in, regardless of whether ultimately it would have driven kind of the, the, the you know, the bottom line outcome. Well, now that you're seeing success and seeing that there's, so, is there, is there plans to expand it? I mean, is this a scalable initiative? So it's scalable only if you partner with others. Um, obviously, we are a non-for-profit organization, uh, and our strength is not in building a supportive housing unit. Right. The fact that we um, collaborated with a city agency, collaborated with the CBO, and now our parent organization, New York City Health and Hospitals, is forging the way uh, as a provider in securing more and more uh, housing units. So now collaborating even closer with our parent organization and still the CBOs and, and frankly at this point city and state uh, resources, uh, we absolutely see tremendous potential in securing more units and placing, uh, and placing more members who need that. I'm going to shift. That's great. And I, I want to shift gears to some other bright spots or initiatives that you guys have executed and are making great inroads with. And I was reading and tell me if I've got this wrong about the uh, healthy rewards program uh, that you have. And I'd love for you to tell folks what it is. I don't, it's an incentive program, right? So okay. I, a little bit more about what it is, how effective it's been and, 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 and maybe I'll ask you some follow-ups about that. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. So we launched the rewards program uh, about four years ago. Um, and the goal of the program was to both help us uh, incentivize people to take care of themselves, uh, close um, any kind of gaps in care, both in terms of preventative care and also maintenance care if they have a chronic condition. And frankly, also to help with uh, plan satisfaction and retention. Um, at this point, uh, we have over 100,000 people enrolled uh, in the rewards program. Uh, the satisfaction rate is 96%. Um, so clearly, uh, a lot of people think it's worthwhile their time to, uh, to enroll and, uh, they think it's worthwhile their, uh, their time. Uh, and so we reward, um, people for, as I, as I mentioned, for preventative care, uh, to maintenance care. And recently, because of the pandemic, uh, we introduced some additional incentives, uh, the one that I like the most, uh, and was a huge supporter of is, a reward for kids for doing well in school. So we know that kids were really struggling during the pandemic with remote learning. Uh, and while we always offered um, rewards for families, kids and adults, et cetera, we wanted to do something to help the parents. And so for the parents to know that they can now, if they can't afford to do this themselves, they can use our rewards program to incentivize their kids to do what they need to do in school. 
Um, so the way it works is on the back end, we see claims um, activity that shows us that people are doing what they're supposed to do, right? They're getting their mammograms, they're getting their colonoscopies, they're filling their medications if, they're, uh, if they uh, need chronic medications. Um, they do some administrative things such as completing a health risk assessment. Um, we created uh, an orientation to the plan so that when new members join the plan, they can view all of the benefits and really rip the benefits of, of the plan. We want them to get the most value they can out of the plan. So by just viewing a very user-friendly video that explains to them everything they, they can get out of the plan, including the rewards program, they get a reward for watching, watching the video because we want them to feel, even if it's... Even, even if it's free for them, even if they're not paying anything at all into the plan, we want them to get the most value out of it, out of the plan, out of the coverage. So we incentivize them to watch the video and then we reward them for it. We reward people just for other healthy activities such as drinking water or, or just walking. So it's a combination. Okay, hold on, hold on, hold on. We're gonna ask you, <laughs> this, this seems super cool. So if I'm here, so uh, you said HRA mammogram is colonoscopy included in that? Yep. Okay, so if I'm if I'm a member and I go for my colonoscopy, you do you see the claim come through, and, and do I? Had, right, then, we had and, points to your to your account. My account, and I get notified that I get points added to my account, and eventually I get a certain amount of points. And what can I do with those? So you can accumulate points. You can pull points with other family members. And then you go into a catalog and you just buy whatever you want from the catalog with the points. And we're not talking about trivial stuff. I mean, people accumulate points and they get blenders, they get art sets, they get all kind of all kind of things, strollers, diapers. Um, okay, okay. Let's so so for example, because I want folks, and I have a few more follow-ups. I want folks to understand how to execute this. I love a good smoothie. So let's say I'm going for a blender. How many? How many points does that take roughly? I'm, I, I know you probably don't know the catalog by heart, but just generally yeah. ballpark. And, and then what am I getting for my colonoscopy, which was a pain in the neck I just had in mind? Or, <laughs> or you know, to, to have you know, my wife do her mammogram or, or, or to do an HRA. What, what are we, each one of those tasks is how many yeah. points? I mean, it's between five and $10 each. Each, each exercise I'm getting points worth five to ten dollars. So yeah, for a colonoscopy, five or ten dollars for a, for a mammogram, five or ten dollars. Okay. Uh, so if you reach a certain amount of steps, five to ten dollars. HR. So, so I do five or six of these. I have about sixty ducks. I could get myself a decent blender. Right. Exactly. So it's not trivial. I mean, no. it's very clear to us that you know people are not going to be incentivized for or a pen, right? Or a magnet. It needs to be something that's meaningful to them. Um, Let's talk about execution. That seems like a lot for you guys to handle. So I'm guessing there's a third party you're partnering with yes, that, there to, is. To, pull, to pull this <laughs> off. So tell us a little bit about, if you want to mention the third party, feel free, but uh, tell us a little bit about how to set this up a bit if, if someone else wanted to do this. Yeah. So we work with Finity. Uh, they are uh, our vendor. Um, they work nationwide. Um, they are really a terrific, terrific partner. Uh, not only that they know the rewards business in and out, they have a lot of uh, experience there. Uh, they are thought partners to us. Um, they came up with a suggestion to have the rewards for kids during the pandemic, and we jumped on it. So um, the execution is really partnering with somebody who understands human behavior understands how to execute this, understands what it takes to launch it. I will tell you that year one, a lot of the spend was on promoting this program, a lot. I mean, <laughs> significant, significant amount of the budget for the reward was to promote it, to make sure that people know about it. Year one, uh, year two, still massive, massive, massive promotion um, to, to members in 
all kinds of ways, right? Brochures, postcards, texts, phone calls. Did, did you measure, like, do you measure, I don't want to get too much in the weeds because I don't want to bore folks here, but yeah. do you measure the customer acquisition cost, meaning taking a member, converting them to a rewards customer, so to speak, and then measure, okay, it took us $20 to get that person to join and watch that video. And then two years later, this is the cost of care that we've, this is the cost of care that we've saved. I mean, how do you look at it now? Yeah. yeah. So the way we look at this is uh, in, in two ways. One, uh, the primary goal was, was quality, to improve quality. And uh, as you mentioned, we, we're ranked number one in the, in the state. Um, obviously, we're very proud of it. So we look to see whether people who are engaged in the rewards program have higher um, gap closure of their clinical clinical measures? And the answer is yes. If uh, people are enrolled in the rewards program, we see much higher rate of closing clinical gaps. So higher mammogram rates, higher colonoscopy rates, uh, better adherence to chronic medications. So we see, we see that. And obviously that feeds into our success. And ultimately there is an incentive program from the state uh, for doing doing well on quality, so that's that's one piece. The other the other aspect we're measuring regularly is retention. So if people enroll in the program in the rewards program and are we split it between use just enrolling and not doing anything about it, and then enrolling and actually using the rewards uh, versus people who do not enroll, and again we see a significant difference in retention rates. So people who enroll in the program. Um, we tend to retain them for longer periods of time and the churn is significantly lower compared to people who are not participating in the program. So that's how we are looking at the success of the program in, in terms of kind of the bottom line, if you will. All right, you get to, you get to fund it in two ways, right? Through, through, through both member retention and reduction in costs, assuming that uh, I'm taking the assumption if it's true that the more the more folks that are enrolled and the, and the more gap closures correlates with, with lower claims costs. Right. How, um, so to that end, uh, so really interesting, you're partnering with the CBOs and lawmakers, you're doing some neat things on site there. You're, you're putting up local offices. You have a unique innovative rewards program that seems to be um, resonating with your market. Uh, now let's talk about the most sick, the most chronically ill, and with such a diverse population set, you know, where you're basically this global melting pot, literally, uh, in New York City. How are you able to manage that pop, the pop, the chronically ill in each one of your markets, and and handle the different ethnicities and languages that you have to staff? So we hire locally. Um, all of our operations, um, our call centers, our care management um, department, ev everything operates out of the city. So we don't vendor out any of the core services. So nothing is being administered from any other state and certainly not from, from overseas. So by uh, recruiting locally, uh, we essentially recruit employees who reflect to some extent, right, the, the members that we serve. So we speak, I don't remember the, the recent number, more than 26 languages, I think, here, just the Metro Plus, not, not talking about a translation line, et cetera, just locally, just us. Uh, so certainly our employees are extremely, extremely um, diverse and come from the cultural backgrounds that, that we serve. Do you have any public incentives to do that? Or is this just all driven by the best interests of the business? Uh, it is driven by who we are. There is no public incentive for, for that. Uh, it's, um, it's really a, a dedication of, 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 of ours to make sure that we are as as diverse as the people we serve, not just as a lip service, but in, in reality. Uh, and we know it works better. It works better. It's not something that you can just teach someone. Yes, there are cultural competencies and cultural sensitivities 
um, it is much more profound if somebody is already coming from that culture. Um, so we believe in it um, deeply. And so that's how we structure our recruitment uh, here. So, so that's one part. The other part that, that helps us is uh, the collaboration with our parent organization, uh, who obviously focuses on, on similar populations. Uh, and there is a lot of attention there as well uh, to support the underserved uh, in, in meaningful ways uh, by providing services from providers who have the same uh, background uh, and also providing additional supportive services that a lot of those populations uh, have. The, the other aspect of it, and it's more, it's, it's trickier now during the pandemic is some of the business uh, of managing care, managing chronic care can be done uh, remotely or telephonically. A lot of it, especially uh, for, um, for people who are recent immigrants or people who uh, know the system um, you know, to, to a limited extent, the help needs to be more uh, kind of a face in a face-to-face -face format. So we deploy our care management uh, into the field to go and meet with our members at their homes, in the hospitals, Dunkin' Donuts, wherever we can meet them. Obviously, everything came to a screeching halt for a while uh, while the pandemic here was really raging and then the numbers uh, uh, were increasing every day. But this is what we've been doing and now we restarted doing this uh, as well. Not just kind of telephonic involvement, but really understanding people's lives, uh, their challenges, and um, becoming a trusted resource, not, not just a, a, an agent who calls you on the phone and you don't uh, have a face to associate with them, but somebody you actually know, you actually met, you know what they look like. Uh, they, you have their phone number, and so you have somebody to go to. It's mostly true for people who need the most support. And so we're talking about people who have complex medical and behavioral needs. Uh, we can't do it across the board, obviously, that's, that's not scalable, but we identify the people who have the most need, uh, and that's how we support them. Great. It's really, really interesting. Uh, it, it amazes me just how effective you guys have been, and uh, my mind's racing, and like why... I'm sure other folks are trying to do this and maybe may even saying we are doing a lot of that. It just seems like you're, you're getting so much success out of it. Uh, I'm, one, I'm, I'm curious in, in the back of my mind, like what's, what's really, how are you doing it so differently that you're, you're more effective than most in doing it? And so I, I guess, because I, I know we're getting a little bit tight on time here, I'm, I'm going to ask you, when you think about the investments you've made in the organization, is there an investment, whether it be with time, money, or both over the, let's say, the past three years that you guys have made that has made the most profound impact or an incredibly surprising profound impact on the business that maybe you could share with us that could maybe enlighten all of us to a little bit behind what makes Metro Plus Health Plan so, so effective? Yeah. Um, so I think one part of it, um, it's not, uh, it's not probably surprising, is not to try to boil the ocean. Um, and so when we invested in, uh, in social uh, uh, terms of health, uh, we, um, we really decided that we want to focus on housing. And so what we did was we actually went and hired people from the other side, people who were on the, uh, uh, the housing side of, uh, of the city. So they knew the process in and out, um, right? They work with um, the housing and urban development um, agency. So they were on the agency side working on developing housing. They really understood the process, the challenges, the people, they had the network. These were the people that we hired to come to the plan. So not people who have um, insurance plan background, but people who have specific background around housing. 
And so when they came here, they brought tremendous, tremendous knowledge uh, and tremendous kind of know-how to us. Uh, and so I think that, that was probably one of the best decisions we, we made. And then the other one was stay focused. There, there is so much need, right? People are struggling with many, many issues, not just housing. We identify this as a priority and we focus there and we really grew the team. We have a, a, you know, a robust team that that's all they do. They only deal with housing issues and then uh, they essentially continue to be involved in those people's lives, as, as, I, as I mentioned. So I think- okay, uh, can I, I want to ask you a follow-up to that because I think it so that sounds great. And when you're listening, it sounds like, oh my goodness, that's what we have to do. But I think what gets missed in that answer is how incredibly difficult it is to say no to all the other things you're going to say no to. So you said, don't boil the ocean and stay focused. See, when you're thinking SDOH, and we could list all the social determinants, everyone listening could list at least 10 social determinants. You decided housing. So how did you go about saying no to all the other things that are so important? Was there a process in place? Was it just you as the CEO saying, hey, no? Because that's an incredibly hard triaging decision to make. As an organization, so how did that? How did you go about doing that? Yeah, so I just want to say it's not that we're ignoring the other social determinants, right? Because <laughs> people have needs. We just uh, don't have a whole dedicated uh, uh, task force. For so we collaborate. We collaborate with with CBOs. We uh, we have a lot of resources to refer people to. So we do address other social determinants. Absolutely, uh, we have. You know, pretty substantial collaboration with um, uh, with vendor who address um, food insecurity. So, and you know, we made pretty significant investment there as well. This is it's happening. It's just not happening to the same level of investment and depth and time as um, it's happening with housing. So, I'm not advocating choose one and and uh, ignore the others because there's a lot of other needs. Uh, but I am saying uh, it makes sense to, to choose one very meaningful one and really go, go deep while you're addressing the others with more uh, traditional kind of uh, uh, ways. The decision around housing uh, was not complicated for us. We, because of the amount of homeless people that we have, we look to see what their utilization looks like. Um, what, uh, what do they cost the plan? What happens to them over the course of their tenure with the plan? And the numbers were staggering. They were absolutely staggering. Uh, not only on the financial side, but just to see what happens to those people, how many times they're in and out of behavioral health facilities, uh, you know, medical admissions, uh, all of the plethora of, of, of conditions that they have. When we looked at the utilization, what happens to them on the bottom line, the, the picture was pretty clear that this is the population that needs the most help. And we, that, that's, that where, that's where we need to stop. Not, that's where we need to start. Not, that's not where we need to stop, but that absolutely sure. made it very clear to us. So, so along those same lines uh, around your thinking, is there a process or a system or even a cultural shift that you've helped drive that has improved the organization uh, significantly over the last three years, something to help us understand, like I have the strategy, I have the tactic, I, I, I really appreciate what you did with the, with the resource allocation for the housing strategy. Uh, anything around a process or system or cultural shift at the organization, or maybe it's something that you, you inherited when you came on as CEO that is in place that you think is unique and really important to the success of the company. Yeah. So I think a lot of people talk about data uh, and how data informs decisions. And we had data here uh, prior to, to my appointment, um, only that we had multiple sources of data. They did not necessarily align with each other. And there was a lot of skepticism around the accuracy of the data. So while we had it in place, it did not really inform decisions. And so it took a while, I have to admit, it was a significant effort. It took 
almost a year and a half to completely revamp how we look at data here, um, how we trust data here. Uh, we centralized that data was uh, very disparate here. Uh, each department was creating their own reports, their own, uh, their own insights. We centralized it um, with, with input from the departments, but now it's one unit. Our health analytics runs all the reports, produces all the information that's our only source of truth, and that's, uh, and that's informing our decisions. That's how we knew that we needed to go after homeless people. That's the data uh, we use to identify where should we open our next um, community office? Where are the populations uh, with the highest need? So centralizing the data, uh, re-looking at the accuracy, accuracy of the data uh, and making people believe and convince people that the data reflects reality and then taking the data into account in how we make decisions, I think probably made one of the most uh, profound impacts on how we make decisions and how we operate. Okay, so I have to ask, and it sounds like a whole separate episode, but I need to hear at a high level, how did a relatively small Medicaid plan in 18 months have the resources to to pull that off? Did you bring in a third party? Did you just hire some really smart folks? Was there something? Yeah, blood, sweat, and tears. That's- <laughs> Volunteers. <laughs> blood, sweat, and tears, that's, that's the answer. Uh, a lot of, uh, a lot of you know, smart, dedicated, hardworking people. Uh, a lot of direct involvement for me, frankly, to make sure, because I knew how critical this is for the company. I knew that if we did not know and relied on the data, we won't be able to make the smartest decision. So, so yes, it, it was, we restructured, restructured how the unit operates, where it reports to, what it does, how much support it's getting, and we made sure me and the executive team to elevate this to the level of importance that it required. Okay, let's close up with this then. So everyone's listening. What's one thing that you hope everyone who's listening right now would take away uh, from this conversation? And you know, if there, let's pretend there's just health plans and health providers listening right now, what would you want them to do or copy uh, from Metro Plus Health uh, as, as you're trying to, you know, help inspire a healthier country, not just a healthier city or healthier state? Yeah. I think um, we all know that health is complicated um, in general. Uh, the health system is very, very complex and the needs are tremendous, especially in, in, in kind of the vulnerable populations. And so, I think the takeaway is finding the right partners is the make or break. It is the make or break for us. Uh, not just, you know, kind of somebody to refer to and, and, you know, hope it works out, but really finding partners who will work with you to solve, to solve some of those issues. They're complicated, they're expensive, they're massive. And so regardless of how well the plan is performing or how well it's, it's funded, it's just never going to be enough. So being really smart and discerning in, in who those partners are, what their impact is on the issue, and then just being relentless about building this, uh, this partnership to benefit the membership. That's great. Thank you so much for doing this. If you want to check there at Metro, the, the company's website's metroplus.org. Uh, Talia, how do people find you? LinkedIn, you're probably listed on the your, on the executive leadership of, of the health yes. plan. Yeah, right. LinkedIn or yeah, our website. Yep. Great. Dr. Talia Schwartz, everyone, uh, thank you very much. Uh, make sure, folks, you listen, you check out our new website at sharepurposeconnect.com where the Bright Spots in Healthcare podcast is listed there. You could subscribe there using any of the platforms you typically consume. Uh, podcasts or watch uh, videos by way of YouTube or our website. Thank you again for listening. This marks the end of the show and we will see you next episode. Thank you. Great job. Great job.